particularly for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Uh, we, we, uh, we can count on, on singing that in, in one way or another over, over the, the, the Christmas season. And it's good that that's familiar. Now, if you if you're read through that, uh, and or or listened as I read it, if if you actually if your attention wandered, that's also forgiven. But anyway, but if you're reading that, you know, there's there's some material in there that's not as as usual. Uh, you know, ending with the zeal the Lord of Hosts will do that. I mean, you know, if uh, if I promise to 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 you know bring the groceries in from the car, I do not say. The zeal of the husband of the house will do that. You know, you're just kind of making a big deal out of something that just should be normal. And uh, so we, you know, we don't use the word zeal. We don't talk about rejoicing in the harvest. I mean, we actually have to remind ourselves on Thanksgiving to be thankful for food that farmers grow. We don't, you know, you don't look at the tomato and start, you know, jumping up and down. It's not that way. Um, and so there's unfamiliar material in there, but... but how familiar and how relatable is the idea for to us a child is born and to us a son is given. And, it, and part of this is to give you, give you a, a knowledge and a grasp of the gift that God is giving in Jesus. Because there are many true ways to talk about what God has done in Jesus Christ. There, there are many true ways about the, to talk about the kingdom that he, is, that he has given to us and the salvation that he worked. And if we said, you know, the king is coming, and that is, that is a line from the Gospels, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, the presence of the king is here. But that is, that is in itself a little different. It's like, because it is like saying the boss is coming, you know, he is coming, uh, look busy, I don't know, you know, but, you know. But also we know that when someone important arrives or the boss visits or someone takes charge of a situation, whether they take a, the reins of government, you know, they're, they come and they go. You know, the boss hangs around and then if you wait long enough, he's got more boss things to do. It, it's, it's, it, ha- it can have that sense of, well, to come and to be. Now he comes as the king, as it says in here, to reign forever and ever now and forevermore. But again... The idea of someone in great authority coming is one piece. It's true to talk about, but it's different from a child. Another, or we could also say, you know, the, the, the great salvation that God is bringing. You know, this period of rejoicing. We shall rejoice as if of a harvest or if, or if we have run a great victory in battle and we're, we're, we're dividing the plunder. And, but when we talk about a great and happy time coming, that's a true way to talk about the kingdom of God. It is, it is that rejoicing, that celebration you will see, you know, in the faith of Christ, you will see the celebration that is after this life and in his coming kingdom. And when the blessings of heaven are, are poured into your life. But also if I talk about, you know, the big happy time is coming, we do that with Christmas. It's Christmas time. Get, you know, get excited, get happy. Dec- you know. But we know that such times come and pass. Or also that the circus can come to town or the festival can be in the streets, but it's not necessarily in your house. You can be as gloomy as you want in your house, even if people are dancing in the streets. But to say, for to us a child is born, is a wonderful way to understand what the coming of Jesus is all about in this sense. That he comes to stay and he comes into the most intimate parts of your life and he makes a vast and a permanent difference right in the place where you live. And it also gives us that it is, that is, it is, you know, I, it's usually my job to make the gospel relatable, but I want to point out how relatable that is. That so many of us, and, and some, some, you know, this year know what it is to, to have that child born or that grandchild born. And the bell that goes on, the light that happens, the, 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 the fearsome and tumultuous change and the joy that is part of that. And you can look at this and say, well, okay, I'm going to be all of eternity understanding the joy and the blessing that God is to me. And this is one piece. 
the joy is of a child added to your house. And also, importantly, it talks to us about a joy that we probably don't deserve or never knew or could hardly measure up to. Children being born in the house would be either one, perhaps for some children have never been born into the house, and you know what that means. Or you see children and you say, I I don't deserve this kind of a blessing. Or how can I ever measure up and live in a correct response to a child coming into the house? Because a child changes everything in the house. Everybody must deal with the child. Suddenly the family that might have been at one, two, three, four, five, is now one more is added, and it is a permanent change. There is so much about the life of that child. Everybody has to put the permanent change. And consider God is saying, to you a son is born, and it is a permanent. It will never not be a thing in your life that this child was given to us at Bethlehem. Now, you know, and that, you know, I, of course, I knew when, when children began coming along in my family, when, you know, my, my children, uh, that, that it, was a, it was a big deal, it was a permanent deal. I didn't have any children I planned to rent and then send back home. But, interesting, my, my, my son was born first, and he's preaching a very good sermon in Cuyahoga Falls, but... He's not here. So anyway, um, my son was born first, and then when he was long, about two, two and a half, his, his sister came along. And, and Quincy was so compliant, such a good child, like false advertising for how easy it is to raise children, because was, there was nothing to it, man. And, and he, was, he would sit there and play with his toys quietly and look at his books and ask intelligent questions. The whole thing of, you know, first child that takes all its cues from the adults. But his sister had, was having none of that. She was going to be a, a full-blown child, full-blown baby. And, you know, she's getting about nine months old. And she's just sitting in the living room screaming about something because, you know, I, I still don't know what she wanted. But it was screaming and crying. And it would carry it on. I know like 15 minutes straight, either a whiny sound or a really loud alarming sound, and she's just going on. And Quincy looks up from whatever he was doing, books and toys, regards the situation thoughtfully and says, can't we just put her outside? (laughs) And you had to explain, she's here permanently. This will not change. And you have to deal with, you have to deal with the moods and the welfare and the, and the requirements of the child. Now, the child that God sends, of course, is a gift to us, but we've got to live in response to that. As my, as my family all knew, the, it was, again, it was the sons that, that regarded the sisters, you know, because the sisters just saw a little sister and said, oh, so cute, woo, you know, that was their reaction. Uh, Micaiah understood well after, you know, had two younger sisters after him, one more sister came along. And he told us later on that, you know, even though you have a child, baby in the house, and you might be called upon to change, you know, the well, change what needs change in a baby. Do this, you know, because, you know, look, we parents, we did most of that, but they're, take, take this. Time. He actually managed through the whole early years of his youngest sister's life to not do any changing. He always just sort of edged away and wasn't to be found. <laughs> or didn't exactly lie, but just let it be implied or guessed that, He'd done it last time. It wasn't his turn. You know, he pulled that off for the whole diaper era of one child. I'm so proud of his deviousness (laughs) and his cunning because he is a good brother to all. So, but that child has to be lived. You have to live in response to that child. And this child in the scripture 
having given us this picture that it is here, he is here to stay. He is here to take up residence in your home, to make a lasting change in your life, and to be such a presence that you must respond to it. Isaiah says, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I tell you, for the Bible student that is familiar, as I am, with the Old Testament story and the scriptures and the promises that are fulfilled, I still sit up and rub my eyes at that. Because for Isaiah's hearers, they would have to say, what is he talking about? How can there be a child born to us who is the mighty God? How can there be one born to us who who will be known as Prince of Peace? That concept was unheard of, but that is Isaiah all over. In reading through Isaiah this year again, I decided I finally found the, the hook, the understanding. He's so excited about the Messiah, he does not know what to do with himself. He goes on about a chapter or so, and he might have been talking to this king. Amos over here, he might have been commenting on this situation in in the land over there or encouraging the people this way. And he can't get about a chapter and a half before he has to talk about the Messiah. He has to talk about, you know, you know the problems that we have. You know the difficulties that we are encountering. You know the sin that clings so tightly. You know, you know the failures that you've had. I'm, I know all that, but I'm just so excited about the Messiah that God will send. And this is a phenomenal verse, you know, for somebody coming from that, that Hebrew background. There was but one God, and he created the world, and he gave you commandments, and you'd better listen. And he sent his prophets, and you can just plan to listen to them too. And his law is, and his will is, and his deeds are, and he's sending his son. That one will live among us as nothing other you recognizable as a son, as a child, as a man grown among us, but he will also be mighty God. He will be everlasting father. He will always be father. He will never abdicate his role as father. He will always love you as a parent loves you. He will always be in your life as someone that, that, that you've always known and knows all about you. And he will never cease to bring new life and new children into the family of God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace, one who the government is on his shoulders. You know how much those who are in government and power ask you to carry things, you to pay the taxes, to mind the laws, to accomplish the task. If there's, realize when somebody in government says that roads shall be built and, and programs shall be launched, well, that means somebody's going to pay for it, and somebody doesn't mean they're doing it. But all the government shall be upon his shoulders. We will be the ones that are the beneficiaries. There will only He comes, and he is a servant, and those who are his ministers are servants as well. And, on the, and he will reign upon David's throne, heir to all the promises that were set upon David, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. All, that, all, that, all whoever were ruled over by David, all whoever called of God's people, now will know this one as king and king forever. And of the increase of that government, of the authority that is done, of the works that he pulls off, of the, of the kingdom that he proclaims and thrusts into the world, there will not be an end, but it will come with justice. It will not come with what, you know, what do my evil overlords now want? But no, it will always come as justice. It will always come as, as blessing. And that peace is what God plans to bring into the world. How Isaiah puts all that together, well, believe me, I don't know, except that is the inspiration of God that has told him to go to a people, well, the people. You see, this child, this remarkable son, the promises attached to the son, the qualities of the son make me want to look back at the promises 
that he will address at the situation because that's where we started. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Sorry, <coughs> it was quite the cantata. I'm still a little... Anyway, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. First off, take that, think about it theologically for a minute. Does that mean we had some problems? Does that mean, well, we had a certain difficulty and here God is with his Messiah? Or that there was some, some stuff going on and it's finally... Get no, we're walking in darkness. What hope do people who are walking in darkness have of ever finding their way home? What hope do people who are walking in deep darkness have of ever avoiding obstacles and not falling into a pit or drowning in a river? The people are walking in a great and deep darkness. In other words, they are lost. And in that sense, where you could have a darkness that is so deep, my basement has that there's no outdoor window. If you go down there and happen to turn off the lights. And until a light breaks out, you may as well not walk around because you'll just run into stuff. The people who are walking in darkness, the people who had no hope of finding, call it the way home, the way out, the way through, they had no hope of doing that. They have now seen a light. And that light sets everything in perspective. That light shows the way around. That shows the obstacles and the dangers and is hope. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned to understand we all live under that land of shadow of death. We all cannot solve that problem. And so then he says, you know, you on them, as it is as the one who rejoices at the harvest or when men divide the plunder. That's, that was after a victory. And he is bringing out to us that, that you know, we, have to, we can go Bible study and, and think about the situation of the scriptures just enough to say, there was no guarantee of a good harvest. No more than there was a guarantee of a victory in battle. They picture those two things. A great harvest and we're rejoicing. We're saying, this is more than enough, man. This, I can't believe all this. The plunder after the battle. Very strange idea to us. In ancient warfare, that was how soldiers got paid. You won the battle, you stole the stuff. That was just how it was. You didn't know if you'd win the battle. The enemy was there. The enemy was strong in their own right, and you did not know how things would turn. Isaiah is taking those two situations and says, this is how it will be like. You didn't know if you were going to get through. You didn't know if there would be victory. You did not know if there would be safety. You did not know if there would be success or what circumstance might come. This is God bringing you through. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He is given to you. It says, finally, as in the day of Midian. And that's rough. That is actually another sermon, and we won't do the whole other day as in Midian sermon today. Check back here, maybe February-ish. Okay? But understand that Midian had destroyed everything. They had taken everything. They'd wrecked everything in the land of Israel. That's the description they're hiding in caves. They can no longer, if there were crops in the fields, the Midians are, they'd covered the land with camels. Does that not sound disgusting? And they were overcome by faith and the zeal of God. The day of Midian is the story of Gideon. Sorry, they rhyme unintentionally. And Gideon was encountered by the Lord's angel who said, the Lord desires to save these people. And they responded in faith. And the situation was turned entirely around. There was life instead of death. There was plenty instead of want and scarcity. And there was rejoicing in God instead of lamentation and loss. Isaiah describes that the cosmos changes. The universe is upended because God has taken a hand. He says this child in our house that intimate that involved that stupendous that once in a lifetime but continuing ever that's the child we talk about 
You know what you want to do with a newborn child is to hold it. You want to hold it. Remarkable in the, in the gospel stories, the only one that actually described as holding the child Jesus was Mary to swaddle him and Simeon in the, in the temple to lift him up. You know, if you were one of the shepherds there, you might say, you know, clean my hands. Can I hold that child? In the New Testament, hold in many places is the same word as carry and bear, as Mary carried the child. Hold and carry and grasp mean that intimate, inward possession of the things of God. Indeed, Mary, the Virgin Mary carrying the child Jesus is one of those first pictures of the Christian. You want Jesus right in there. Intimate, close, heart beating with yours. And can I hold that child? Can I grasp that child? Can I assure you that you can hold that child by faith? Can I? Okay, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have, hold, same word, same word, eternal life. This child is promised. This child is proclaimed. This, that's the, what the joy and the singing and the rejoicing is all about. And this child is available to us by faith. He just says, I, I want you to come to me. I happen to aware of the situation you had this week. I understand where it wasn't a very good performance. I'm all up on your weaknesses and that you don't deserve this. But I ask you to take it by faith to receive the things of God because he has offered them to us in his son. Let us pray. So, Father, we know that this is, this is business we have to do. Lord, we cannot say that, that this needs put off. You've given us that picture. This, this has to be done now. We should grasp you by faith. You should understand, Lord. You, it, yeah, it's a call to repentance because there's, there's a lot in my life that does not deserve your love but you offered it anyway. There's a hope I have not known, and I ask, Lord, that you make it to break open in our lives. There's a peace that's unfamiliar to me, and Lord, I ask that today I know your peace. There's a strength that folks haven't seen in me, and I ask, Lord, that you'd be my strength. You want to respond to God and say, God, let, let me grasp that just now. Give me the faith, Lord. Give me that gift of faith that there would be salvation break out in my heart now. Your hand can also go up to just to say, oh God, thank you for the gift of this son. Amen. The altar's open as we sing. You can come, you can pray, pray over yon less way by, for your need. If you'd like me to pray with you, you're invited to come to this side. Join us once again, please.
God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.